Interview with Mr. Blaine L. Cottom, 24 January 2001, Syracuse Armory. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert Von Hassel. Videographer is Mr. Wayne Clark. Mr. Cottom, tell me where you were born and, and where you grew up. I was born in a little boondock town called Summer Hill. It's in Cayuga County, not too far from Cornell U University, which is at the end, southern end of Cayuga. It's uh, like between Corlin and Auburn, more or less. Uh, Summer Hill. Uh, in fact, uh, there was four of us children, three of them were born here. The other was born in Colorado, the oldest. So. What did your family do there? Well, my grandfather ran a cattle ranch in a dairy cows, not beef cows, out in Colorado. And Dad got out of the war and went to work on the ranch. This is uh, under Cliff, Colorado. <coughs> and I'm going to take this head off. Uh, so Dad helped out there. In the meantime, my mother went out with her sister. Back in those days, if you had a lung condition, you went to a high altitude. So that's how they met. Dad was still in the Army and uh, working on the farm a little bit. And uh, he got discharged. And my, they met and married. And, uh, went back to Ohio to be married, but the, uh, uh, my oldest brother was born before they decided to come back to New York State, which upper uh, St. Lawrence County, which is where they were originally from when they came over from Canada. So uh, I grew up in and around Cortland. Summer Hill's only seven or eight miles away, and that's Cayuga County, but Cortland County. Uh, I grew up in a little town of Blodgett Mills during the late years of the Depression, or excuse me, the early years of the Depression, early 30s. My first memory is about 1930. And I went to a school there up to eighth grade. We had moved to Cortland. Uh, now we got to jump from eighth grade to 11th, which takes us from, uh, uh, we'll say, uh, 1937 up to uh, the summer of uh, <laughs> the summer before the war started, war started forty. This summer of forty-one. Okay, Dad was making peaky boats for the Navy in Elko Shipyards, Bayonne, New Jersey. Mm. My brother Kenneth, later you'll hear about him. He got killed on a PT, but he joined Dad as a carpenter. They lived in Bayonne, New Jersey, making PT boats for the Navy. They made twelve. When that contract was finished, they opened up Annapolis Yacht Yards in Eastport, Maryland, across the Naval Academy. This is how I got enthused about the Navy, listening to that music every day. But uh, they had a contract there for 10. Well, instead of coming home weekends, Dad took the family, except for two children who stayed in Cortland. My brother Ken, myself, my mother and I, we rented a house down there, and she rented out rooms to the shipyard workers, which were from all over. So anyway, I fell in love with the Navy. Every morning I'd hear them march to chow, march to class, and I visited over there, and my sister come down, and I got her a date with one of the midshipmen, and I fell in love with the Navy, and I was there when the Japs dropped the bomb on Pearl Harbor. I had just started my senior year at Napa's High School. Now what happened was uh, about half a dozen of my friends said, we're going to quit. Now we're all 16, some maybe 17, but I was 16. My birthday wasn't until three months after the war started. But anyway, I felt enthused about it and all that, and always patriotic, military background. Uh, I decided I'm going to quit school. Well, they had different ideas. So I didn't go back to school, but I was bound in the tent. I went up to Baltimore, took my exam, had everything, the paperwork all set, so that my birthday in April 9th, uh, I, I could leave. Well, sometime in February, they finished that last contract, so we moved back to Cortland, New York, and I actually left for the Navy from Cortland uh, just shortly after my birthday. It took us a week or so to get settled in and all that, so instead of leaving on my birthday, I left the 20th something. It's in my records there somewhere. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, I went from uh, Cortland, New York to Syracuse, finished my exam, passed it, went home, got a ticket to Albany. Had the final medical there, went to Newport, Rhode Island, Coddington Point, Company 513, United States Navy Training Center. I was there for a little over a month. Now, ordinarily the training period is longer, but this is a wartime, so they taught you the basics, what you needed, 
and left the school choice or further training up until you left boot camp. So I had a choice of subs or aviation. Well, in order to get into aviation, first you've got to know a little about the Navy. So I went to RCA Radio School in New York City. I was taught by civilian instructors for two months. For the next two months, I was taught by Navy instructors on the big equipment we use on the big ships. And this took four months. And I'm going to say that I was 12th in my class of 500, and I have a newspaper clipping somewhere. But uh, this entitled me to my first strike, third class radioman, fleet radioman. Now you notice there's wings on here. This is after you go into aviation. Once you go into aviation, they add the wings. The regular one is a big spark picture. But anyway, I was third class radioman. I went from there to Millington, Tennessee, outside of Memphis. Brand new air base, all full of mud. On the way down, uh, one of our officers that was in charge of us in transit uh, got sick. And they said, anybody here know how to get these guys to march? And me, I'd been in a drum corps in a band, so I said, yeah, me. Good. You're now an acting petty officer. You're in charge of getting these guys to church, to class, to wherever we got to go. So I was at Millington for two months, and I learned the difference between the big stuff on the ships and the little dinky ones they put in the aircraft, the aviation radio. I had already learned how to use the Morse code, uh, key, send and receive. Now it's concentrating on earphones and voice. So I learned what I didn't learn in New York City there. From there, uh, I volunteered for aviation in New York, but now the next step in my career was Aerial Ground Gunnery School, Hollywood, Florida. I was there through the Christmas of my first year in the service, and uh, I was there for two months. Now there, we, we rehearsed shooting at anything that we could call a target. We would have a plane fly over with a 50-foot rope in a round canvas bag called a sleeve. Three at a time, we would take three colors of paint, paint on the nose of our 30 caliber bullets so that it would leave a color if we pierced the, the canvas. We had that. We learned how to shoot skeet. We learned how to lead the target. We also learned golf, uh, anything that we could shoot. We also, the beginning of the electronic age, we shot on a screen with electronic signal, some of the first games that you see now that are very popular. Okay, now, I went in in April, now we're up to past Christmas. West Coast, four days. I want to say this, they pulled that old railroad car out of mothballs in World War I because it was falling apart, but it was the only transportation we had. Every railroad car in the country was busy hauling troops. So we get to Alameda. Now that's one of the West Coast large naval air stations. It's in San Francisco Bay. I check into Treasure Island, which is where they had the World's Fair just prior to the war. Slept my only two nights in the Navy in a hammock. And then I got transferred across the bay to Alameda, like I say, Naval Air Station. Here, we ha after about two days of lectures of what they're going to expect of us, our squadron was in the making. You'll see that later on here. But uh, some of the squadrons coming back from the first combat in the Pacific uh, were being reorganized. And uh, so in the meantime, rather than sit around, they put us in, in uh, scouting squadrons. Now, the initials for scouting squadron is VS. And as it turns out, I was assigned to VS-48. And I put some of the knowledge about aerial gunnery. I used to transmit my messages to William Six Victor, the Coast Guard station underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. In other words, I'll tell you how we protected the West Coast. From Mexico to Canada, in pairs, you'd go out, I'm just going to use a figure, 100 miles. You'd take a 90 degree corner, 30 miles, come back on the triangle. The other guy filled in the other half, that's a rectangle, two of us. We did the whole coast from Canada. To Mexico. And anything suspicious, we phoned in William 6 Victor, the Coast Guard Station, Golden Gate Bridge. I can still use that key today. So we spotted foreign ships that didn't really understand our language. Part of my duties was on the first approach to the ship, incoming ship, was to take my blinker and da 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 
That's C. No, excuse me. Da 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 da. CQ means identify yourself. In the Navy, we have flags about this size, all different patterns and colors. They run up a, a pole. The part of our duties, we had to learn what those flags meant. Well, any seaman that has communications can read what the, the message is that they run up. They do it with flags. So on the first Passover, I would send them a signal, identify yourself, da 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 with a blinker. And some of them just didn't understand or too lazy or maybe uh, slow in reacting. They wouldn't do it. So we'd make a circle. My pilot had fixed guns. Now this is the OS-2U Kingfisher. It's a seaplane. We can land on water when the wheels come out and down, or we can land on, on the bay like we used to when we were based at Alameda. So anyway, I'm trying to get all this in. I'm probably talking too fast. But uh, like I say, the second Passover, uh, if he didn't run up his identification flags then, uh, he was in trouble because I called William Six Victor with my Morse key. Out would come a couple Army bombers from somewhere north of Frisco, Deep Six. Didn't ask questions. We couldn't afford to. The Japs were running miniature subs up on the beach along the California coast at night infiltrating industry with these people that came ashore in darkness. And I want to mention here, Roosevelt did the smartest thing he did by doing this, rounding up every Jap, whether they're born here or not, because some of them were sent here. I've studied Japanese history. I can take you back to 1932 when Japan first planned Pearl Harbor. I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. Anyway, we rounded up all the Japs to slow this down. These incoming ships, most of them would eventually run up the run up the flags. I would read them, interpret it, send the message back, okay. What I wanted to know is where are you headed for? Berkeley, Oakland, San Francisco, what beer, what's your ETA, expected time of arrival, all this. So then we'd go on and finish our, our our triangular area we were scouting. And these hops lasted about four hours. That was about what our gasoline we could stretch. We'd go back and on the way back, we'd see the incoming coming out. So we had all hours of daylight, we're scouting the coast. And uh, this was good training. I got a chance to use my twin 30s. Uh, I got a chance to, I was manual release back then before we got fancy. I pulled the lever, we dropped a couple, we scared a couple. I think we were responsible for reporting one, which the Army bombers deep sexed or fighters. But uh, it was good training. In the meantime, they got the works going. They took bombing squadron VB-1, bombing squadron VB-2. They were 18 plane squadrons, brand new. Our carriers needed more help. So instead of an 18-man squadron, we went to 36. We used, utilized the hangar deck more and brought the planes up with an elevator and then got them off. This way, we didn't have to get 100 planes on flight deck. There's no room. Remember, these carriers are only the length of a football field. The brand new ones, you can set my old Enterprise and Intrepid three times compared with the new nuclear Eisenhower Kennedy. But we did what we could. We organized one and two, made a new outfit called Bombing Six. We inherited a very famous number. I lost some friends in the first one I'd been writing to, and I was anxious to get into bombing six. This is part of Air Group Six. It's 36 planes, torpedo six, VT six. 36 fighter planes in fighting squadron, VF six. VB six, 36 planes. So about 100 planes make up our air group. That's about all we can handle with that size character at that time in history. My second ship, I'm going to jump ahead here for a minute, my second ship was the Intrepid, which was larger than the old, original, good four we had to start the war with. The Hornet, the Enterprise, the Yorktown, and the Saratoga. I'm concerned mostly with the Hornet and the Enterprise. They were sisters. They were launched together, commissioned together, started the war together out there. In fact, they were our only defense in the Pacific at the beginning of the war. More about that. Okay, so anyway. We spent a little time training there. They assign us a brand new famous one of the first aces in the Navy, Butch O'Hare, Lieutenant Commander Edward O'Hare. His folks 
were, uh, we'll say, politically involved in Chicago and Washington. And after Butch's death, later, I'll get to that, they named O'Hare International Airport. He was my skipper. He was skipper of all three squadrons. We went to Hawaii. We trained. Butch had been through the Battle of Midway. He had, I'm going to guess, five to seven. Became one of the Navy's first aces, knocking down Japs. Uh, was in all that early action out there. And uh, they sent him back here to encourage the public to buy bonds and support the war effort. And he earned the Congressional Medal of Honor and was presented that. By the time he got through selling bonds, we're all trained on the island of Maui in the Hawaiian Islands. Been there approximately four months. And we learned everything we needed to know except the enemy wasn't uh, fighting, it wasn't shooting at us there. Once in a while they'd get in close and we'd have an emergency hop, take off, and I saw spotted a sub off of Guinea or your bay or something. Like we did get a little bit of combat. We were in the combat zone, but we weren't getting shot at there. Anyway, he gets there. So they unload all his stuff and uh, we're standing there talking. He says, uh, everybody ready to go down south? That means head for the Japs. Yes, we are. Well, let's have a beer party and a ball game. Officers against the men. Well, I hate to tell you, the officers won, but boy, we enjoyed that. It was hot. I sat next to Butch O'Hare on the bench, and he had a little pot belly. He'd taken out a few pounds back here in the States, eating all that steak and stuff. But anyway, sat there, shook hands, two or three of us there. O'Hare says, I'm new at this. I ain't done a thing for three or four months here since the Battle of Midway. How would you guys win this war? You know what we did? We offered advice to a gold break. Ask the enlisted men what the tough situations are, how to get out of it. They're the ones that are in there, in the mud, facing the enemy and everything else, instead of behind a desk. No disrespect to the officers, but contact the enlisted men and you'll shorten the war. You'll find better ways to get the job done. And we had a good, long conversation. That night we went out night flying. I'm going to tell you a story probably untold. Butch drank. He learned that, probably selling bonds. But he drank heavily. So did the officers, so did the men. We were headed for combat. Those bullets are real and that blood's red. Butch got a little emotional that night when he started telling us about his battle during the Battle of Midway. So anyway, we had a good time. And he says, everybody on the flight line, that's 100 planes on the flight line, 7 o'clock tonight. If you can't fly drunk with me, you don't fly in my outfit. Well, we lost two pilots that night, not the planes, not their lives, but two got transferred because their propellers, he kept telling us tighten up. Our best defense is a tight formation, more concentrated gun power in a tight form. Don't get straggles because that's when you're going to get picked off one by one by these lonesome kamikazes and everything else. By the way, kamikaze means they not only crash into your ship, they crash into your plane. A lot of you people never heard that. My two best friends, I was best man at the wedding before we left California, both got shot down by kamikaze. I don't mean shot with bullets, I mean they crashed into them. It's a hell of a thing to say, but here he's waving his hand goodbye on the way down, nothing you do. Planes on fire, what do you do? So long. Anyway, we head out for combat on the USS Enterprise, the most decorated ship of World War II. We go down in the Gilberts and the Marshalls, you've heard of some of these names battles I was associated with in that area, some of them directly involved. My target was a tower on a Japanese island called Tarawa. The Marines later took it at a big loss of life. We knocked that tower over and then we went back to strafing the beach ahead of the Marines. And that, now I'm going to mention some names. These are all involved in the Gilbert Island Andy Weetalk, Roy, Nehmer, uh, oh gosh, well, Kwazulin, I believe, is Marshall Islands, but uh, these are some of the familiar names when you study the first early battles of World War II in our island hopping campaign. These are some of the initial ones because we got a foothold in the Pacific. Now, we ain't got to be scared back in Hawaii because we can stop them here if we establish a beat. The CBs come in. Supply ships, a big crane, set off a completely equipped mess hall, completely equipped uh, radio shack, communications, uh, electric shop, warehouses, uh, all this stuff. Set them off with a big crane. 48 hours, 
putting down the steel mesh we're flying planes off of there. I want to mention the name of one of my best buddies. His name is John O'Dell. He lives up the road from me in Homer, New York. He was a Marine SBD rear seat gunner like mine. I'm always kidding. I had a beautiful life out there. I got shot at, but at night I went back to the Holiday Inn. I had a milkshake, I had a haircut, I watched a movie, I watched guys box. And you, you poor bastard, excuse my language, you had to go crawl in your foxhole on that damn island after the uh, CB set up a base. So, but we're, we're in love with each other. We're not queers, no. But we did the same job. What these kids that are going to see this don't know. Blood is red. We shed a lot of it. Diamond six. Practically wiped out. Torpedo eight. I'm talking to the stuff that happened just before I got out there. Torpedo eight. One survivor, Ensign Gay. Fighting three off the of Yorktown. Yeah, practically wiped out. The Japs had a plane made out of wood. No armor to protect the pilot. They left the extra space to the extra gas and the extra ammunition to carry it. So, take it out, fly us. The plane we were using at the very beginning was the F-4F Grumman Hellcat. She did fold her wings and allowed us to get more in a small space. She was replaced later by the Hellcat. We were fortunate enough to be the first outfit to use the new F-6F Hellcat fighters, successor to the to the Wildcat, F-4F, uh, more manpower, rubber protection on the gas tanks, in other words, a self-sealing. If a bullet pierced it, the rubber would close up. Uh, more armor, chest plates come around the pilot. Now, the Japs never had this. Now, remember I told you earlier, I'm going to tell you a story. In 1932 to 34, the Japs took out some equipment in a crane and a digger and shaped an island to look like Pearl Harbor. Looked like a twin to it. You flew over, not knowing history too well, you could swear to God that was Pearl Harbor. And they practiced for eight years. Back in the early years of the war, a lot of our nation's high brass, the admirals and the generals, says, how are we going to defend Hawaii? Now, why have we got to defend them? Number one, Japan is a rock. No place to grow food. This is why they attacked China. Their warlords took over and started building up their armed forces. They needed oil. This is why Indochina. This is why their world domination of the Far East started way back in the early 30s while we're suffering from the Depression. This was well planned, well rehearsed. Their best pilots practiced for eight years. Now you can look at this up in any records. Some of this has been told, some ain't. But they were well prepared, it was well planned. Our Washington people knew it could happen. They were warned. So they devised a plan to protect Pearl Harbor. On this plan, they estimated what the Japs would do. They would approach from the Northwest. They would send a diversionary force to the Aleutians. They would do all this. And guess what? The Japs did it, just like they fall on the blueprint. Just the way our top brass, our top people said, this is. If we were going to attack, we would do it this way. And the Japs followed it letter for letter. There was nothing we could do. Congress kept cutting their budget. We started the war with crude equipment compared with what the Japs had developed behind our backs. We signed a treaty with Japan called a non-aggression or something like that, which meant you can't go down to Indochina and fight and steal their oil. You can't do anymore. So we started fighting tigers. General Chennault, Pat Scrano was here yesterday from Corley, New York, through the hump. We're attacking from the rear because Japan had crossed the pond, they were fighting China. They wanted their wheat, grain, everything else. Also down in Indochina, which today is Vietnam, Cambodia, and that area. I made a pretty good study of this, so I hope my words are accurate. Awful lot the kids don't know about this war. And this is the only way they're going to. I thank this program again for bringing this to the attention. This has got to be recorded before we all die. Associated Press says we're dying 75,000 a week. 
you kids see this. You live in America, the land of freedom. You hang out on the corner, why? Because me, Pat Scrano yesterday, that gentleman that was on here before that went from North Africa up through Italy and all that, they gave up their youth, most of them. We had some older, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. We had some CVs, 65, 70 years old, put on the uniform again after they'd retired, come back to help build a base so we could take one island one at a time toward Japan. You don't realize how big that ocean is out there. We had to take them one at a time at a hell of a cost. We had to do it because in the meantime they're sneaking up through with illusions. I was up in Adak, Alaska later on. I was part of a thousand ship task force which left in 45 before VJ Day. We amassed, that means got together. There were so many ships up there if I wanted to go home just put them in and I could have walked to San Francisco. 26 carriers we had up there. We started the war with four, I believe. Not counting the old uh, antiques, the Langley and a few others. But anyway, the Japs, when they hit Pearl Harbor, they sent a diversionary task force up in the Aleutians and they took uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Atu and Kissing. That's it, okay, Atu and Kissing. Later we took them back. But anyway, that was to pull our attention away. They were trying to sucker us and to send in our only two carriers in the Hawaiian waters up there. That would have been, they'd have had no resistance. But here's another thing I want you kids to know. This story hasn't been told either. You want to hear a story? Ask the enlisted man. Because he hears the skull about every day. And he reads that stuff that goes in the wastebasket and the true story comes up. What happened was Admiral King was the naval aide for President Roosevelt in Washington. The Hornet and the Enterprise, my later skipper, Halsey, was captain then, not an admiral, in charge of the Enterprise, and I forgot who was on the Hornet. But they wanted to go in. When they heard the news of Pearl Harbor, they wanted to go in and get back. Washington says, no, if we lose you two, we might as well study Japanese. Go buy a book on how to <coughs> live with the Japs, because they could walk into San Francisco unopposed, literally unopposed. They could have walked into Hawaiian Islands after they sunk all our fleet. I have figures. You all know about the battleship Arizona, 900 of my Navy buddies, deep six. They decided to leave them there. Awful lot you kids got to learn. They stopped teaching you in school. They taught you how Washington threw a silver dollar across the Potomac, okay, and a little bit about everything, but the real history of this country is the survival of World War II. My mother saved grease, tin foil, even wood, brass, copper, anything. We had subs off the East Coast, Jap, or uh, Nazi. We had Jap subs off the West Coast. We got very little new material in. We had to make do. This was the beginning of recycling. Make do with what you got. And yet we supplied England, Italy later on when they came over to our side. We supplied all our allies as well as our own multi-million dollar armed forces that we built up. How the hell did we do it? We did it by recycling, using it over. America's famous for throwing stuff away. But now they see we're running out of natural resources. We're putting it to work. Okay, let's jump from that. From Pearl Harbor. Where did I leave you? West Coast. Okay, I went over there, we finally left, did our first battle action in the fall of 43 in the Gilbert Islands. This was followed by a couple of trips back to Pearl to replace our personnel, bury our dead, newer equipment, modifications to our old equipment, a little rest, R&R &R you call it, back out again, back into Pearl again. I was in Pearl for Christmas, 43. Okay, somewhere along here. Previous to that, we lost Butch O'Hare. I'll tell you a story about him. The Japanese Betty Bomber, we call him, Betty for short, would come over at night in the darkness. Now, the Navy at night couldn't fly. We weren't equipped. Besides, you can see even a light off a paper match from miles up. That'll let the, these Jap people find you and see it. Just a speck of light, you can see it. So Back then, there was no question. If you lit a cigarette topside, that means way up visible to the skies and the clouds, they shot you. They didn't ask questions. 
couldn't afford to jeopardize all the lives of them guys and the ship itself. Anyway, uh, uh, you couldn't shut that for just one second, could you? Take these glasses off. I had them on to take a look at this logbook. Something came to mind that I had sort of forgotten. I was a little time in the Navy hospital at Pearl Harbor. Uh, I have a leather holster over there that kept me busy while we were recuperating. I could take my kneecap off and hand it to you. And they sewed it back on. I also had a lot of trouble back then. Everybody did. I don't know if it's the air conditioning on the ship or the weather, the humidity or what, but everybody had tonsil trouble. And I was taking sulfa, which was popular back then uh, for my tonsils, but uh, I'll look back at this again. Okay, I'm in the hospital in Pearl Harbor. I'm looking out the window. Some of you that saw the movie Midway saw the Admiral that had a skin condition. He was stuck in the hospital, missed some action, looked out the window and there was a tree in the way, and he says, have him cut that tree so I can see my old ship. He was mad. He was hospital bound, couldn't leave. Well, I looked out the window, and my old ship, the Enterprise, is going out the channel. Later on, I found out why she was going out the channel. She wasn't really leaving me. She was going out to sea to refuel. Because after we learned a good lesson at Pearl Harbor, we stopped refueling our ships in the harbor from the tanks that were around uh, the various locations there. So all the ships were refueled at sea. Well, anyway, I looked out that window from the hospital, and here's my ship. I raised hell with a lieutenant commander nurse in charge of my floor, and she called the chaplain. The chaplain come over and he says, what's the matter, Bob? And I says, my ship, I gotta get the hell out of here. It's my ship going out to harbor. He says, calm down. He motioned the nurse to give me a needle there to put me out, but he did. He got on the phone, and then he talked with the nurse, and they found out that, you know, I could recuperate aboard, headed back for combat, just while well laying there, and I'd be with my group. So anyway, uh, with the help of a couple shore patrol and a jeep, they got me down to the docks, and I went uh, aboard the uh, USS Lackawanna, which is a oil transport. Remember now, I've just mentioned, refuel at sea, not in the harbor, because boy, it'd be a good time for them to hit you. And we never knew from day to day if they were coming back. But anyway, we had pushed them to a point in the Pacific where we didn't think Pearl Harbor was, uh, you know, a target anymore, because uh, by this time we were getting new ships out, new ones commissioned, we were getting more carriers, everything, production's rolling. Well, I looked out, and uh, like I said, I got aboard the Lackawanna, a tanker, and we went out through the channel, and at sea, about 40, 50, 60 miles out, a uh, storm come up. Well, we had got orders to get the hell back to combat, because the Japs are doing something. So, anyway, we had to refuel regardless of the weather. Ordinarily, it's dangerous. What you have to do is take a harpoon light with a, a gun charge, shoot a small line over the bow of the other ship, and then with that small line, pull a bigger and a bigger and bigger, and then finally the hose. And that's how you refuel at sea. Well, when they stretch this line across, they also transfer mail, ice cream, bananas, whatever they do. But I rode that boatswain's chair, and this damn storm, the two bows came together. Well, as long as they were parallel, that stayed fairly tight, you know. But them two bows came in real quick, and that rope slacked, and they dragged me for, I don't know, 100 feet in the water, so I got back aboard my ship anyway. And here's the high point of it all. Uh, a couple of guys helped me into the ready room, which is one deck below the, where the planes take off from. Uh, enlisted men have a ready room where they get their last instructions and all that, and the officers and the pilots have their own. They dragged me down there, and in comes Lieutenant Peters, the communications officer. And he, hey, caught him, is that you? He said, I had you down AWOL. I said, thanks. But anyway, we got back to combat. Now, I think previous to this, I got you up in November when we hit the marshals. We didn't take them then. We took them after the first of the year, early in 44. And one island, Kwajalein, in the Marshall Islands, that comes to mind. Well, each one of these took its toll. 
we were losing men, planes, and everything else. Remember, we're getting better equipment now. Finally, with these new fighters, we can outfly the Zero. We've learned how to fight the Kamikaze. We've learned how to increase our firepower. Tight formations. Massive firepower. Cover. But anyway, we go back to Pearl ever so often. New men, new planes, and uh, boy, the new stuff that was coming out. And the guys are better trained. And uh, we're getting rid of our wounded and so on and so forth. But uh, we go back to Pearl. I was back there for Christmas at Kaneohe Bay, which is on the other side of Oahu from opposite Pearl Harbor. And we go out again. And uh, this time, uh, I think we hit a couple on the way. We stopped at Majuro. Majuro is an island, I'm going to say halfway between Hawaii and Truk. It got into Jap hands once, we took it back. We used this as a staging point. We left material there, we dropped off men there to be transferred somewhere else. We had gasoline storage there, everything. We also had a cemetery there. Anyway, I'll get back to that cemetery in a minute. But we went and took uh, part in Task Force 50. 8.1, 58.2, 58.3. We had enough ships, men, equipment, planes. We split our group into three attacking forces. Attacked from three angles, three sides. Our target was truck. Truck is their nearest to Japan, largest Navy, uh, Japan Navy base. Three one million gallon storage tanks of aviation gasoline, possibly diesel, I don't know. Great barracks. A lot of warehouses full of guns, uh, all sorts. This is their big supply point. Instead of going back to Japan, they'd, their ships would pull in there and restock up and everything. This was the uh, fly in the ointment. If we could stop them there, then we almost had easy access to the mainland. Now remember, a lot of big battles happened over this, but we're trying to stop them from supplying their fleet. Because after we took an island, They'd come back again later after we got established and they'd sneak back in, try to take it back or at least do damage. So if we cut off everything at truck, we're going to slow down their uh, efforts to resupply their fleet and it's going to get us that closer. Remember, this is island hopping, one island at a time. A lot of Marines lost. You got to give credit right here to the Seabees. They're the guys that made the bases. Marines went up the beach with the Army, took the beach, as soon as we establish something, the CBs come in, set up an operating air base, radio tower, communications, toilet facilities, uh, desaltination plant, you know, take salt water, make fresh water. 48 hours after the CBs put down steel mesh, we're flying planes. My buddy, my Marine buddy that did the same job on an SBD, only as a Marine, same training, same plane, would come in and take over. He would fly off of this to protect the island or stage attacks until he got transferred to another island recently taken. But this is the way we went across the Pacific. It's a big ocean out there, people that are watching this. We had to diversify our forces so bad, split them up where we didn't even have enough sometimes in a task force to do the job. But we had to stop them or slow them down. But finally, America, with their production, the number of men that volunteered and signed up and trained, new planes, guns, everything, everything being improved. You'd be issued something one day and three weeks later, the issue looked like the same, only improved. But uh, we gained as we went through this war. We got better, they got weaker. Our losses started going down, theirs started going up. And we get to the island of Truk. Like I say, that was their biggest main. If we could chop that off, take that away from them, or at least wreck it, which we did. Three days in February, 14, 15, 16 of February. The Army had established bases on some of these islands, so their 17s and their 29s could fly long range, do a lot of damage during the night. The Navy didn't fly at night. I'm going to tell you a quick story about Patrol Hair now. I'm going to go back to the Gilberts. My first skipper, uh, Butch O'Hare, he went up after a couple of kamikazes that night. Now the Japs had come over, dropped flares with parachutes, lit up the whole ocean. We couldn't stand this. Kamikazes would come in. Butch and another 
Hellcat fighter and a torpedo plane full of the latest radar went up at night, unheard of. They, Butch got a couple of them and got shot down. I got a new skipper then, named, well, I had two of them, Ike Hampton and D.B. Inger, so. But uh, remember, that's back on the Enterprise. Now we're on the Intrepid at Truck. Sorry to jump around. We had them three days in a row at Truck. The Army hit them three nights in a row. We had destroyed just about every visible target there was on the a uh, little bit after midnight on the third night, February 16th, 17th, just after midnight on the 17th, one of their planes came in, got us, we took a torpedo, we suffered heavy damage, no steering, finally with help and some old guys rigging up sail and two destroyers pushing us, got back to Majuro. Eventually, after they patched her up, made her seaworthy, we got back to Pearl Harbor, took four days to issue us new clothing, pay records and get us squared away, transportation in the United States on the USS White Plains, a Jeep carrier. That's a cut the top off a cruiser, put a flight deck, transport men and equipment. Also, you could just barely take off and land on one of them. Back to the States and the combat. Back in Frisco in April, home on leave. I became an instructor after that. Uh, I did join the fleet again up in the Aleutians. Thousand ships, just weeks before they dropped the A-bomb. So I did not see any further combat after February 16th. We left combat waters and by the time we got back in uh, Pearl Harbor it was secure enough that part in the war where we did not call that a combat zone anymore. It's just a staging zone. And so that's about it. Good plane, hold on there for a minute. We're going to have to switch tapes. Take two interview of uh, Mr. Blaine Cottom on 24 January 2001. So, Blaine, after you got back to the United States, so you were assigned to uh, uh, gunnery instructor duty? Uh, gunnery, radio, operation of the radio in a much smaller radio transmitter and receiver, and all stages of my job. Uh, how to clear your chambers before you land of uh, amb live ammunition, all sorts of things that would help him do his job as, now we had a long title. We were listed on the books as an aviation radioman, either third class, second class, first class. The last jump in the enlisted was chief petty officer. But we were also known as aerial gunners. We had a separate patch right here, aerial gunner patch. Uh, and it was a combination of a lot of things. Operate the radio, operate the communications. We sat backwards with a pair of twin 30 machine guns, later 150. But uh, when I was there, it was twin 30s. We protected the rear. The kamikaze is sneaking up on you. Uh, also, we, uh, I'll tell you a little story here. We used to break off into little three-man formations like a V. And believe it or not, instead of looking back, you looked across at your buddy. He's looking across at you. This is how we communicated. Is that thing aimed at my hand? This is C, da, di, da, da, on the side of the plane. Hold your hand out. No radio. Couldn't use them. Radio silence. They can pick up your signal. That's how we communicated. The pilots also. So we did it with dots and dashes by flat and knuckles. And uh, no communication. We looked across, protected the other guy. He's looking. No new way of protecting each other, seeing everything around you. So I, I enjoyed the Navy so well. I became an instructor and I tried to teach guys how to do my job. I'd been out there, I'd learned it thoroughly. I believed in it 100%. I went from Modesto, California from a cow pasture. We invaded a cow pasture and set up a base as training. We went down to 29 Palms. They issued us Marine Greens. I was transferred to a CASU, Carrier Aircraft Service Unit. Now these people went in after the Marines and with the CBs got a base in operating order. Took over the electric, the radio, communication, chow and everything else. 
uh, new, there was also an outfit called ACORN. I'm not sure what the A-C-O-R-N stood for, but it was all in occupation of an island, getting a base a little closer to Japan that we could operate off and, and uh, further the war effort. Uh, as an instructor, I travel most of California. Port Wainimi, Point Magoo are now a big missile center. Back then it was just a hole in the wall. Uh, Ojai, California is a uh, like a country club up in the mountains above uh, L.A. and uh, Santa Paula Ventura area. This was a rest center for submarine and aviation men. I also got sent up there for a rest. I hate to admit this on tape, but I will. I told the officer in charge I wasn't going to mention it. I studied not to be a priest because I'm a Baptist, but I studied to be a minister before the war. They taught me how to kill that safe. When I got back, I was so torn up. I went to see a psychiatrist. Believe it or not, his first question, this was a three-day deal, then he kicked me out. And I left voluntarily, though. First question he said, you want to go back to combat? And I said, you need a psychiatrist. That's real out there. I'm not prepared. I'm a young teenager. So my whole life changed. I went into plumbing and heating. I did not become a minister. But I spent the rest of my days teaching new guys. And then I got sick of floating around doing that. Got pretty monotonous, so taking on a few pounds. Other guys going to combat. My sister was a hospital corpsman at the Navy Hospital in Oak Knoll, California. She was the first blood relative I saw. She was taking care of the wounded when they unloaded them, brought them in. First guys back from combat, she took care of them. She'd write letters home for him and all that. My brother Maynard was on a destroyer in the North Atlantic, convoy duty. They were picking him off left and right. He was topside during a storm, and some uh, guy from the boondocks dogged down the hatch, which means closed the entrance to the stairway to get below during the storm. He got batted around during the storm, ended up St. Albans Naval Hospital, Long Island. Eventually, later, after recuperating and a return to the hospital, he did get an honorable discharge instead of a medical. He wouldn't take the medical. I'll tell you another little story. I refused my air medal. And then later it was given to me, the ribbon only, because the medal wasn't available. They're making shells and ammunition and jeeps and everything else out of it. Later on they caught up with me and uh, I thought I was going to get it, but I want this on the record. Somewhere down in Washington is the authorization. I have a copy of it, my scrapbook, authorizing my skipper. I got the air medal for so many battle stars. I have battles, seven battle stars. The intensity of the battle determined whether you got a star on your Asiatic Pacific ribbon. I have seven from my air crew wings. These are special wings made for us, the enlisted man. They're different. They're not gold like the Navy pilots are. But there's holes in there, and you add a star for a major battle or a major accomplishment. I have seven of those, which equal the seven battle stars, the seven major campaigns I was in. you got to get in there and get shot at, get a lot of guys killed and everything else before they designate it a major battle. Uh, this looks like a lot of color and decorations up there. But uh, we earned them. We started the war with crude weapons. They got better and better, and finally our stuff was better than the enemy. Uh, after the war, I went into uh, heating. I got home. Well, well, first, I got out in San Diego. Remember I told you they dropped the bomb in the fall? Well, it took six months to get us out. If they dump us all out as civilians, the market would have been flooded. Nobody would have had a job. So anyway, uh, I stayed in California until the snow melted in New York, and that was in the middle of April. I phoned my mother and uh, came back to New York, got a job at Sinclair Refining Company, distributing heating oil, gasoline, grease, so on and so forth. I was with them for four years. Uncle Sam paid my training. He paid half my salary for two years. The boss paid the other half. At the end of three years, Uncle Sam lessened the amount he paid by 25 percent, the boss increased his. the end of four years, the boss is paying it all. That's how I got into heating. I made a whole career 
almost, well, roughly 50 years. Right now, I consider myself an engineer. I have diplomas on the board, which are in return for studying my manufacturer's product and passing a course, question and answer, drawings, everything to do with plumbing and heating. I went a step further, got into the engineering, designing, and now I am in a business after retiring from the Plumbers Union. I have a 30-some year pin coming up this year. Uh, eight years of my own business, residential plumbing. Uh, what I'm doing right now is I'm digging into the science of getting back from nature energy. We started out this world with no Niagara Mohawk, New York State Gas and Electric, no electric phone, no telephones. You built a fire to keep warm, cook your food. You didn't plug in an electric burner or a coffee pot or something. Like we can get this energy from nature. This is what I'm into now in my retirement. I have snow melting in my own house. I don't want to advertise on this thing. But I melt my snow while you're out there freezing shoveling. And you leave the snow and ice and I melt it, so it's safe to walk on. I'm going to do this for my town of Homer as a gift for living there 40 years. Wonderful friends. My Marine gunner buddy lives up the road. He's a retired salesman on the road many years. He's going to come in. I have some young guys coming up that want to learn. I'm teaching a class at BOSIS uh, on plumbing application, how to do it yourself, how to get into this free energy. It's free after you get the equipment to do it with. But the source of the energy is free 24 hours a day, even in darkness. So enough about that. I love the Navy. My dad was in Army One. I'll tell you a quick story. Have I got time? Yeah. Quick story about my dad. He was in the ammunition corps. He drove a truck, taking men, ammunition, food, and everything to the front lines. He got up there somewhere. I'd have to look at the notes. The whole front lines is dead. Somebody handed him a rifle, he went in the front lines, second day got shot, ended up in a mastoid. Eleven years later, because of gassing, he had a head of kidney removed. Back in the 30s, they took a hacksaw and cut you in half. They didn't have modern medicine. My dad had two heart specialists, kidney specialists. One of them wanted to operate immediately. The other guy says, no, you better fatten him up, you'll never survive. But it took Dad two years. He was a carpenter by trade, as way back in other generations. He was two years recuperating. Finally, that body waste got less and less, and that open wound closed up. Went back to work, building boats. Built PT boats for the Navy. My brother Ken helped build them and got killed in the boat he helped build. I'm a little mad right now. The training was not enough. We sent green men into war. We sent Marines into war. Some kids hadn't even started to shave. We sent Navy men into war, not because the Navy didn't want to train them, but because they didn't have time. The Japs planned this thing for so many years in a row. They were prepared. They were well stocked with aviation gasoline to Get, keep their planes in the air. We started with a low budget for the military from Washington, and I do believe the people in Washington knew it was coming. It was just a question of time, but they did nothing. We were in a depression trying to get out. Well, I was poor. I mean poor. P-O-O-R. When Dad would lay down his back, neighbors spent us. We didn't have relief. We didn't have a free check. The only thing I got free from New York State is what we call a 5220 club. I forgot who was governor. For 20 weeks, or for 52 weeks, a veteran returning home could go sign a paper and get a $20 check. Kept me alive. Starting a family. A lot of things you kids have today. Automatic freedom. We paid for that for you. Next time you pass a bet, thank it. Or at least go to the damn parade on Memorial Day or Armistice Day or Flag Day. We don't celebrate VJ Day anymore. We used to have a parade. We don't celebrate VE Day after the war in Europe ended. You kids have got it made. You're hanging out on the corners. You're shooting up for thrills. Our biggest thrill was to get the hell out of combat and get home.
You don't know how lucky you are. Go right back to Washington and the Delaware. They're the first ones that fought for the freedom that you enjoy. Take it not lightly. Take it seriously. Somebody gave you all this free time and freedom, the right to hang out, the right to speak your voice, the right to write without getting sued or getting hurt. You're protected by the what we did, we got for you. Me, this fellow taking the picture, the officer in charge of this program from Governor Pataki, I want to thank all of them. I think it's the only way we can teach our kids how to appreciate our freedoms. And if there's any other questions, I don't know. I think sure. I've covered about all I want to say. Yeah, let's uh, let's take a break for a minute. We're rolling. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to pay a little respect here to a well-loved brother. He was what I called my protector when I was a kid. He used to keep my older brother from beating me up. This is a picture of a PT boat, very fast, high-powered, better than average speedboat, which used to carry torpedoes. The earlier ones used to get going real fast, roll these off the side. The boat would make a U-turn and uh, uh, get out of the area, and the torpedo would go whatever target you had it aimed at. And uh, meantime, the PT was 180 degrees trying to get out of there. This is one of their typical boats, made in Elko shipyards, uh, uh, Bayonne, New Jersey, and also Annapolis Yacht Yards. My brother got killed on one of the boats he helped build prior to his enlistment. So this is not, his number was 194 Squadron 12. I'm not sure about this, but these are his medals from my hand up. Now we have the American Campaign, American Defense, Asiatic Pacific, Bronze Star, uh, Victory World War II, and the Purple Heart. Down below here is Dad's medals, World War I. This is not a true medal. This you get at a VFW convention, but this is the only medal that I know of that they gave the soldiers in War I. Now, that's that brother. Quick word about Maynard. I have nothing. He forgot the war. He was the destroyer man in the Atlantic. Uh, I gave his uniforms and what uh, my mother had saved to the local museum in Homer, New York, Ken Eaton, owner, Clinton Street, Homer, New York, 13077. He's in the phone book. Has a wonderful museum anybody ever goes through Homer. When I was in the hospital in Pearl Harbor, uh, I was in there for a couple of reasons, but uh, really nothing serious. I, I got out of there. But this I made, this is a holster from my 38. The enlisted men had 38s to protect themselves. In case we got forced down on an island or had to use it, pilots had 45s. So anyway, this was something to do and uh, made that in Pearl Harbor at the hospital. This is my logbook. This was underwater after we were torpedoed in February 44, February 16th. Uh, I dried it out and uh, <laughs> lost some pages, but the pages with the stars are the major battles I was in uh, over here near the end somewhere. I'll stop moving it here. There we go, where the stars are. That was the major campaigns I was in. It's all I have left in my logbook. And we had these stamped and signed by the officers, so this is a true copy of my time in the Navy. Just want to give you a total. I had 43 hours when I had control of my airplane, because they taught the enlisted men how to fly to get the pilot and officer back. And uh, I have a total of 271 hours in the air in the Navy, and that's over a period from uh, May 43 to, well, till the end of the war. My total flight time stamped by the commander of our squadron. This, going back to my father again, I don't have much of him left from World War I, but this is a picture of him. Every soldier that fought AEF, American Expeditionary Forces, got a letter from the King of England thanking them for the service. Blank, just hold it up straight because I'm okay, getting like that reflection. Okay. <coughs> this That's is fine. Dad's religious medal he had around his neck and his dog tag. Probably the light shining off of that cellophane. That's okay, I got it. This is a history of his outfit, the 115th Ammunition Train. Uh, he drove supplies, men, food, and everything up to the front lines. 
and he was wounded up there and suffered for many years from it. Uh, that's all basically I have left of dad. The whole family is military, way back. I have a grandfather done, a great grandfather in Gettysburg. This is the sad one here. Following men I'm reading from the top is a list of 373 men killed while serving aboard the USS Enterprise. And they designated uh, that ship by a number. CV-6 was the Enterprise. And this is Butch O'Hare. O'Hare Airport was named after him. And uh, there's another list. Uh, this is more or less the pilots. Air Group 6, it says up here where I highlighted it. Uh, these are our three admirals that won the war in the Pacific. I'll read that there's more than this, but these are the main ones. Chester Nimitz, uh, he had a desk in Honolulu. He ran the operation from there. Uh, Admiral Turner, uh, Spruance, there's also Halsey, Fletcher, many more. Uh, this is my original scarf. There's my initials on there, and here's the U.S. Navy left over. My mother kept just about everything, thank you. Thank God she did. This is my son David. David was an officer in Vietnam. He went through regular basic training as an enlisted man, went to Fort Benning Flight School, became an, uh, an officer, went to Fort Ruckus, learned helicopters, two tours in Vietnam. Total of 20 years in the Army uh, as a pilot and afterwards and retired a major was going to be a colonel, but he went back to civilian life and uh, married a girl from Texas. And he worked 10 years with the Texas Air National Guard down there, teaching the young pilots uh, uh, how to handle those Huey helicopters that he flew in Vietnam. This is my old helmet. Now, we had two helmets. We had a leather one because, remember, in a dive bomb, you go up to 23,000 feet. It's frigid up there. You had a choice. Wear your khaki. Well, uh, maybe you're stationed in Alaska. You wear the leather all the time, but it was identical to this, except it was leather and fur-lined goggles, earphones. That's the original. The patch on the nose is because down in the South Pacific we get sunburned. So that sort of protected your nose a little bit. This is my youngest son, Daryl. I had two boys. This guy would have been in the uh, after days of Vietnam. Uh, possibly a desert storm or something or other, but he ended up in the Plumbers Union like me. He had a gallstone condition, bad kidneys, and uh, couldn't make the service. But he's one of the best plumbers in Central New York. This is my old Navy white hat, dress uniform. We also had a black one for winter. In the tropical areas, we wore whites. In the colder areas, we wore blues like I'm wearing now. The other hat was sort of flat on top and had the name of your ship or outfit on it. This is a couple of caps I picked up here. This one just says I served in the Navy with pride. My old ship, the second carrier, the Intrepid, is at West 46th Street on the Hudson Museum. If you ever go there, there's a submarine there. There's all sorts of stuff there. There's a destroyer there. And uh, it would be worth your while to visit. I go down once in a while and help sweep the floor. Well, by the way, we have an organization, Men of Intrepid. It's an alumni organization. Uh, now, right here on camera, I want to thank New York State, Governor Pataki, and whoever else was involved. This is my high school diploma. I quit school in the senior year just after, you know, the war started in December. My senior year started in September. I got this diploma. Well, I don't know what the date is, November 28th, when the uh, state of New York and possibly thanks to Governor Pataki, those of us that couldn't finish high school and chose not to go back after the war, uh, they gave us our diploma if we were within reason, uh, reason distance of uh, graduating. But anyway, this was presented to me uh, in this past November by the Cortland Board of Education and a little ceremony up there, and I thank everybody involved in my getting this. The only way I could join the Navy was promise my mother I'd go back and get my diploma after the war. So, they did it. They gave it to me.
This is two books and scrapbooks. The carriers won the war in World War II. The battleships did their part, giving us protection. The destroyers protected the battleships and the cruisers, all sorts of supply ships and everything else. The only way we could get from here to Japan was island hopping, and it was the carriers. We started out the war with a couple of scrap pieces, some good ones, the Hornet, the Enterprise, the Lang, oh, the Langley was the old one, Saratoga, uh, uh, some others. But uh, we ended the war with 26 modern aircraft carriers. And uh, now most of them are mothballs or have been scrapped. Of course, these are the old style. The new ones, you can take one of these, put three of them on, a, on the deck of the, the new ones. And of course, the new ones are nuclear powered with uh, probably twice the complement of men we used to carry, twice the area, twice, I don't know about the planes, but of course your planes are all modern and jet and everything else. Entirely different world. But uh, we were, as we look back, it looked sort of crude compared to today's modern fighting equipment. And uh, this is filled with all sorts of stuff. I want to show you a picture I'm very proud of. My son David, the one that I told you was in the, in the uh, Vietnam conflict as a helicopter pilot. After he started working with the guard, he was in close touch with the governor of Texas. And uh, when some official would come down, such as the 150th anniversary of Texas independence from Mexico, celebration at San Yantacito, I believe it is, Bush was vice president. This is the father of our president today. He was vice president at that time, and my son had charge of his security from the time he flew into Texas and still until he got out of Texas. The housing, the meals, the protection, the snacks, the safety, and everything else. And this is my son here, the helicopter pilot from Vietnam. And uh, that's Bush and his wife in the background. This is a copy of it. Here's four great men, four great presidents. I'm not going to let politics enter into this, but I believe the Republicans are concerned with the future of the small guy. This country is made up of small men. We're the ones that fought their wars, and now they're sort of helping us out a little bit. These other two books, I'm just going to lay this aside for a minute. This is the history of my life in the United States Navy. Serial number 6002714. Entry, April 2, 9, 1942. Exit the Navy, January 18, 1946, at San Diego. And there's all sorts of stuff in here. Here's battle maps of the Intrepid's uh, route in the Pacific. Here's fires. These are all authentic Navy. Some of them from our publication of our Alumni Association, Men of Intrepid. And uh, our headquarters is up in Boston. We go down on a bus. This is the Marine Detachment that handled the, the uh, entire circumference of the ship was manned by Marine gunners. And it's an ex-Marine that started this organization. These are all battle pictures, uh, <coughs> all sorts of subjects. Here's the China incident starting the war. Japan's dreams of expan or j expansion to feed their people, to give them oil for the war machine they were building up. Started out in Indochina, which is now Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos. Uh, so we went over with General Chenault, tried to hit them from the rear, up through India. That was the gentleman you did yesterday here, Pat Scrano, was a pilot flying the home. One of our first enemy actions was Rabal. We're hitting back defensively. We got nothing to fight them offensively. Keep them off our back till we can get built up back at home. Now my education here goes up to and including the Battle of Midway, which was our first big blowback. We got four Jap carriers, their first line carriers. They had a lot of them. These are their four best. We got them, we would let them know we mean business, they turned around and went home. At that time, they didn't get too far away from their homeland, but what we had a fleet there to stop them. We had the forces by then built up to do it. We had the men trained to do it. So this is my memorabilia. 
a lot of this will end up in the New York State Museum. I've made up my mind right here now. The son that went to Vietnam, different war, different style. This is another book on my brother Ken, the one that lost his life. In here is his Purple Heart commendation, the Bronze Star, letters from every known figure in Washington that wrote sympathetic letters to the parents, mayor of New York City, uh, mayor of Bayonne, New Jersey, uh, mayor of Cortland, New York, different groups, different, James Forstall, Secretary of the Navy. This is a picture of him with a short haircut, graduation, barber man with a stake, boy was he man. Hunting license and everything else. There he is, one of the greatest looking guys, guitar player, my protector. State of New York will have this. There's some of his old, oh, there's his Purple Heart thing right there. This is a copy, not the real thing. But uh, you got to lose blood or lose your life, and you get it. That's about the end of it, my book and his book. Okay, uh, I want to introduce my wife, Jean. Jean Helen Atkin, United States Navy Waves. 1942 to 44. Jean was brought up in Homer, New York, as I was in that same area. I met her in 1937 at a band concert on the Village Green. Neither one of us had war in mind, but it brought us together later. I didn't see her again until 1946, after I was back as a civilian. I met her at a dance. She tapped me on the shoulder and she says, you remember me? And I said, no. She says, you stood me up in 1937. We met at a concert, you made a date, and never showed up. Well, anyway, I couldn't take her home because she went to the dance with another guy, but uh, I did have chicken dinner the next day. This painting was made from a little snapshot, and, uh, is that okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, the painter's name is a wonderful lady, lives down in my area. Her name is Arlene Withy. I'll give you a phone number, 607-898-5234. Now, she also did another painting of my mother and father uh, together from separate photos. This was from a photo. So, my wife is a retired banker, 10 years jeweler, 23 years assistant trust officer, First National Bank, Cortland. Wonderful wife, wonderful mother. Blaine, what, now what did she do with the waves? I think if I, what was her duties? What were her duties okay. in the waves? All right, in the waves, she was an employee of General Electric. She was like a stenographer, bookkeeper, pencil pusher. When she went in, she uh, after her boot camp at uh, Hunters College, New York City, the Waves Training Center, she had, she had three or four things open to her. But she heard about this communications, naval intelligence, uh, coded messages, and all that. She was a good typist. So she applied for that and got it. So in Washington, uh, a corner of Nebraska and Pennsylvania Avenue, they had a Quonset hut where they used to decode messages sent back from the Pacific and the Atlantic. And these messages were in five letter code groups. It might be A, P, Z, Q, F. Doesn't mean anything. But until they're deciphered, each one of those went through different stages. Twelve girls started out with this five letter code groups and deciphered a little bit. My wife was number 12. She read the finished message. She handed it to an aide who took it to Admiral King, who was the right hand naval aide of President Roosevelt. And uh, she stayed there uh, a good year. And uh, along in the late 40s, I believe it was, they started discharging women out of the service. And she was one of the first to be discharged. We had not the war conquered, but we had the war in the Pacific at a point where we knew we were going to win. It was a question of time, money, men, lives, and they no longer needed the service. We had free access to the airwaves. We could talk in English over the air without somebody getting our message and using it against us. So they really got rid of the girls in the service awfully quick. The wax and the waves and the spires are the other branches of the service that the women served, and they did a terrific job. 
I want to tell you a real quick story. I'm still looking for the woman that took my desk job I had, sent me to see. I don't know what else. I don't know. I think we covered just about everything. Uh, could I, again, thank the people that initiated this program, made this information and stories of true stories of World War II, and why you kids are able to enjoy the freedoms that you have today. I didn't mind giving up my youth. Get off of them drugs and all that other stuff that's killing you. you got to take over this country. We're going to be gone. It's a great country worth fighting for. Take care of it.